David Stockman is everywhere you look. His best-selling books, plus the fact that he was in charge of the budget during the Ronald Reagan years, gets him a regular spot on CNBC and the large financial channels. He is highly critical of Trump and of deficit spending. In preparation for this important interview, we jointly created an exclusive overview, a masterpiece of Stockman's most refined and painstakingly crucial concepts at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash David. On top of listening to the actual interview, I urge you to download the PDF as it goes hand in hand with David's recorded interview. It's critical reading if you want to avoid the fate of tens of millions of Americans who will not be ready when the moment of truth comes. That's PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash David. Enjoy this important interview. Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are continuing with our series of paramount economic updates from the likes of the legendary Gerald Salente, who gave us one of his famous rants. His shockingly accurate track record of predictions is in our report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Salente. Our interview with Robert David Steele reached over half a million views in less than one week, he lays out the case for nationalizing the Federal Reserve, along with other groundbreaking ideas. The free, detailed summary is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Robert. Our interview with G. Edward Griffin is epic, and his report is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Griffin. Today, we are welcoming a very special guest to the show, Mr. David Stockman. David is a politician and an author. He served in the Republican and House of Representatives from the state of Michigan. He is the former Director of Budget under President Ronald Reagan. David's report is important for all investors and every person who is concerned with economic turmoil. The link is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash David. And now it is our honor to be welcoming our guest to the show. David, welcome. How are you today? Very good and happy to be with you. We're thrilled to have you here for many, many different reasons, but we're going to start off with your perspective because going from the era of President Ronald Reagan to now, the United States has changed so dramatically. As a man who ran the country alongside our president at that time and who watched this change take place across the United States, take us back to the Reagan years and compare it to now. Talk to us about what you feel is the main underlying reason for why we have gone through this undeniable change all the way across our country from your perspective as an insider within the Reagan administration. Well, uh, that uh, reaches back almost 40 years. And in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected, we thought we had a crisis. And in some sense, it was double-digit inflation. The economy seemed to be sputtering and not growing. Uh, uh, we had an energy crisis at the time. Commodities were soaring. And so uh, we felt it was time to roll back the tide of big government, balance the budget, uh, get a sound monetary policy that wasn't creating double digit inflation. And that was what the Reagan revolution was all about. Now, in some ways, uh, uh, progress was made. The uh, Volcker was allowed to uh, kill off the inflation. It, it required a pretty serious recession, uh, but uh, inflation was brought under control. Uh, we did cut taxes dramatically, and it did help the economy in the mid-1980s. But on the other hand, unfortunately, we didn't cut spending, and we uh, almost, we more than double the defense budget and so deficits got out of control. So I would say the Reagan era was uh, a kind of 50% uh, success, 50% failure, but it paved the way for the real crisis we have today, which is a, a fiscal equation that's out of control in a central bank that is really wrecking the entire uh, basis for what I call free market capitalism. Uh, uh, one number, I think, or two numbers might uh, uh, summarize uh, the massive shift that we've had in that 40-year period. Uh, when I became budget director, we were struggling to keep the national debt under $1 trillion. Uh, today is $22 trillion, and what I show in my new book, which we'll be talking about, Peak Trump, is that it's, it's heading for $40 trillion. In other words, there's so much momentum built into the budget today. The structural deficit is so large, and neither party cares anything about 
about it any longer, that we now have built in another $20 trillion on top of what we already have over the next decade unless something dramatic is done. That's the first point. The second point is that back then we had Paul, Vo- Paul Volcker running the Fed. He believed in sound money. He said the job, you know, the job of economic growth and prosperity was a job for the American people and business and workers and capitalism. It wasn't the job of the Fed to micromanage the economy and, uh, you know, control interest rates and unemployment and GDP growth and the rest of it, uh, you know, by uh, uh, the hour and by the day. Now, as a result of that change from a Volcker policy to what I call the post-Greenspan world, where the Fed is uh, you know, dominant all over uh, the, the financial system and intruding so deeply into Wall Street, we now have a Fed with a $4 trillion balance sheet compared to only $200 billion when Greenspan took over in 87 and less than $100 billion uh, when Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan was uh, launching uh, his uh, policy in 1981. So these are startling changes, massive changes that have basically transformed uh, what you know we thought was going to be prosperous free market capitalism into a Washington-dominated debt and money printing uh, fiasco that um, I think is uh, going to catch up with us in a big way and make for some very difficult times. In other words, we've been living on borrowed time. We've been kicking the can. We've been trying to borrow our way to prosperity. We have a financial system that has become really a kind of rampant uh, rampant gambling casino. And none of these things uh, uh, will help build what <laughs> Trump said he was going to try to accomplish uh, when he was elected, and that is MAGA. You don't make America great again. Well, you can't make America great again if Washington is even bigger and more dominant and more intrusive than uh, it already was uh, when he took office. Unfortunately, he thinks the Fed ought to print more money, not less, keep interest rates lower, not let them find their market level, and he's exploded the debt uh, in, in deficit, which was already bad enough uh, when he started. So uh, people, you know, in the short run seem to be pretty optimistic at the moment that all of this is going to work out. I've been watching this for the last 40 years or longer, 50 really. I started on Capitol Hill as a staffer in 1970, and we've never been in this kind of uh, mess uh, before with the debt and the Federal Reserve so out of control. So, um, you know, it's a kind of sobering message But, uh, you know, I think we have to face uh, the facts of life. What do you foresee, David, to um, in the near future? Let's sticking with the next five years. Well, I think in the next five years, we're absolutely going to have a recession because no one has outlawed recessions. Uh, The longest cycle in history is 119 months. That is business expansion or uh, from, you know, the bottom from a uh, recovery from a recession. Uh, We're now at month 116 of this cycle. And uh, unlike the 1990s big expansion and the tech boom we had, there were a lot of tailwinds then. Um, we didn't have a deficit problem. In fact, the budget was balanced in the late 1990s. We didn't have a Fed sitting on a big bloated 44 trillion balance sheet that needed to reduce its balance sheet and normalize rates. In fact, there was it was just the opposite. If we look around the world, we didn't have uh, what I call the red Ponzi in China today with 40 trillion of debt uh, tottering uh, and desperately trying to keep its balance. Back then, they were just getting started with the, uh, you know, the boom. And so that added to, to strength in the world economy. And even in Europe, the single uh, currency was just being launched. So they had plenty of room, uh, you know, to borrow and spend and create prosperity, at least in the short run. Now, today, we're in the opposite condition everywhere. China's a problem. Europe's a problem. The Fed needs to normalize. It's going to be forcing uh, interest rates up and, uh, you know, dislocations in the financial market and the deficit's out of control. So when you have all those things going against you and you're at month 116 of the second longest um, 
you know, expansion in history now, you can absolutely be sure that something is going to go wrong. Uh, some black swan is going to show up some morning unexpectedly because that's what black spa, uh, swans are. We're going to hit a recession, and that's where the rubber is going to meet the road because in the next recession, we're going to have $2 trillion plus annual deficits. This year alone, the Treasury will borrow $1.2 trillion, and we're allegedly uh, at the top of a long business cycle uh, and, uh, you know, a healthy economy. Well, imagine what happens when the next recession hits and revenues collapse and we have to start spending for food stamps and all the rest of it again. We're going to be so deep in the soup that Washington will be in crisis and paralysis about how to cope with it. And there will be a, a huge, uh, in my judgment, hue and cry, how did we get here? How did we drift for 20 years and do nothing about it? And remember, when we started this century in the year 2000, uh, the you know the federal uh, debt in the year 2000 was only about four trillion. It's 22 trillion now, and as I say, it's heading for 40. And uh, everybody's just uh, ignoring it because the Fed has been buying the debt and the other central banks of the world. That is, they've been monetizing it. And of course, when you have an artificial buyer, an artificial bid for all this uh, new debt being uh, issued by the government, for a while you can get away with it because you know those big multi. Uh, trillion purchases under QE uh, essentially, um, you know, uh, tip the scale in favor of lower price, uh, lower yields, and higher bond prices. But that that's all behind us. That that's a one a one time trick. They uh, you know they expanded their balance sheet uh, enormously by ninefold. Uh, over less than 20 years. And so now they're, they're trying to shrink it, which means they're dumping bonds into the market at the same time that the Treasury is trying to borrow $1.2 trillion more. Now, you put those two together, and you know, uh, even though allegedly Powell did a pivot and I say a capitulation <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, even though he did all this, they still have QT uh, on automatic pilot, and you know, by QT, we mean quantitative tightening, which means, that, you know, they call it allowing their portfolio of bonds, which is now at $4 trillion, to run off. Okay, it sounds very cosmetic and, you know, uh, and not that important. It's the same thing as dumping bonds into the, uh, you know, Wall Street uh, trading pits, because if you don't... Um, if you don't maintain your portfolio, you're effectively uh, selling uh, debt. And we've never seen this before. In other words, I call it the great, the mother of all uh, bond market collisions in which we have both the Fed selling old bonds and the Uncle Sam, the Treasury, issuing new bonds. The old bonds at a 600 billion annual rate, the new bonds at a 1.2 trillion annual rate, that's added up is 1.8 trillion of uh, federal debt, government debt, looking for a home. Now, the last point I would make is that it will find a home. You know, markets do clear. The issue, though, is at what yield, at what price? And if we have this much supply coming into the market, no big change in savings that I can see. In fact, we're at rock bottom in terms of private savings. We're going to have a real dislocation. In other words, yields will go up, and that will be a huge problem because the entire stock market is predicated on ultra-low interest rates forever and ever as far as the eye can see. And what we're facing right now is the truth that interest rates have to normalize over time once the central banks stop uh, their huge bond buying, which essentially is happening at the present time. Wow. Do you think that the world would be better off without central banks? 
Well, uh, you, if you look at the big picture, you, I would say yes, because, you know, central banks pretend that they're in what I call the monetary central planning business. Now, they, they want you to believe that, uh, you know, they're just there to help out and nudge things along. But that isn't the way it works anymore. They target the inflation rate to the second decimal point. You know, what, what are they talking about? We're not at their 2.0 percent target. Uh, first of all, well, it, uh, there's no proof anywhere, empirically or historically, that 2% inflation is better than 1% or 3% uh, or 0%, which is really the way it should go. So the target is totally suspect, and it's an excuse for them basically to print money and hold down interest rates and, uh, you know, meddle uh, in the financial markets. But then secondly, after they've set up that ridiculous target, they pretend if they're only at 1.8, that that's some kind of big shortfall and they got to lean in uh, to the uh, financial system and force interest rates down or keep them down in order to get their target. This this whole thing is ridiculous. It's, it's the same thing is true with their unemployment. I mean, you know, they say we're at full employment. Well, if, it, if we're at full employment, why do we still have emergency, uh, you know, monetary policy? And clearly, when you have the federal funds rate at 2.4%, which is barely above inflation, that's an emergency low rate. When you have a balance sheet of $4 trillion, which is about, you know, 10 times bigger than it was at the turn of the century, that's still an emergency. So how can you have emergency policy when, when you allegedly have full employment? Well, we don't have full employment because the BLS, uh, you know, sort of U3 uh, unemployment rate uh, is not worth the powder to blow it to hell with, okay. Uh, so uh, the, my point, the, the point I'm making is pr the private economy can handle growth it can handle job creation. It will grow faster or smaller depending on what businesses and entrepreneurs and workers are doing. The job of the government is to get out of the way to the extent that it can and keep taxes low enough so that people can invest and thrive and uh, you know drive growth. We don't need the Fed at all to manage the GDP. In fact, the original Fed, 1914, couldn't even own a dime of government debt, not a note, not a bond, uh, not uh, a bill. And it didn't have any mandate to target unemployment or inflation or GDP or housing starts or anything else. It was only a backup source of liquidity for the banking system at a penalty rate above the market set interest rate, the opposite of what we have today. So to answer your question, I would say, let's turn the clock back exactly 100 years to 1914, uh, repeal the Humphrey Hawkins Act, uh, close down the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, tell them never buy another government bond or bill or note, and uh, allow private capitalism to find out whether we want to grow at 2% or 0% or 4%. Uh, that, that's, not the, that's not the remit uh, of government. That's, uh, an out, that's not something government can will or target or make happen. That's an outcome that should happen on the free market and it'll be what it is. And, uh, you know, we've got this, uh, you know, it's really kind of a statist view of economics, of the, of the macroeconomy that keeps walking. Washington uh, in the business of, you know, running up the debt to try to stimulate the economy or, um, you know, giving a mandate to the Fed to accomplish things that it can't possibly uh, control or accomplish. So the, the, you know, the answer is we get rid of what we have today as an activist Keynesian monetary central planner at the Fed, go back to what, what I call the green eye shades that were intended. You know, the, the author of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 that became effective in 1914 was Carter Glass. Now, everybody knows the name from Glass-Steagall and uh, what he did during the 1930s when he was chairman uh, of the uh, Senate uh, Finance Committee. But in 1913, he was chairman of the House Banking Committee. He wrote it 
And he called, he wrote the act and he called it a banker's bank. And the only role it had was to provide liquidity on a decentralized basis. That's why we have 12 regional banks. He hated Wall Street. He wanted uh, the, the, you know, the new Federal Reserve system, as he called it. It wasn't a central bank based in Washington, per se. He wanted it to have nothing to do with Wall Street and simply provide uh, a kind of discounting mechanism for the good collateral of, uh, you know, commercial banks and uh, local banks uh, that wanted to expand their business. Now, uh, you know, uh, rather than, say, just abolish the whole thing, which I would be happy to do as well, you don't need it in this day and age, at least we ought to go back to the Carter Glass uh, Bankers Bank uh, and get the uh, Fed, uh, repeal Humphrey Hawkins and get the Fed out of Wall Street in the financial markets. Because remember this, um, the financial markets, the bond market, the stock market, derivatives, uh, and the rest, that is the lifeblood of capitalism. If you don't have well-functioning, healthy, balanced, disciplined uh, financial markets, growth isn't going to happen out there in the hinterlands or in Main Street very well either. And so what we need to do is get the Fed out of Wall Street, out of the capital markets, allow uh, the free market to set the price of stocks, the the interest rate on overnight money or 10-year money or 30-year money. And I think we would be uh, a lot better off. None of them ever even have to justify why do we need the Fed pegging the federal funds rate, you know, the short-term overnight money, why couldn't we just let the free market decide what the rate rate was? No one even asks that question today. But if you do, I would bet, ask any of the 12 people on the FOMC, and they would start, uh, you know, muttering and stuttering because they haven't even thought about what they're doing for so long. They simply believe they have a statutory if not divine right to do it. So, uh, you know, I think you're asking great questions. And um, uh, hopefully one of these days after the next crisis and the Fed is totally discredited, which I think it will be, you know, because it's promised people that, not to, you know, the crisis of 208 was a one-time aberration, a hundred-year flood and all that. And mm-hmm. they uh, had the courage to print massive amounts of money and rescue the whole thing and put us back on an even keel. None of that's true. This has been a false uh, uh, recovery. It's been a false boom on Wall Street and very little gain on Main Street. All of that's going to become clear uh, when uh, the next crisis comes. And I believe that finally maybe people will say, ask the question you just did, why in the hell do we have the Fed? Why are they mucking around attempting to accomplish things that 12 people sitting on the FOMC can't possibly be competent to do? You know, you used a a great term. It's as if they have a divine right to come in and take all of our money, use all of our money the way they want to use it, lose all of our money the way they want to lose it, and themselves become very wealthy while our country, the majority of our country, is truly struggling while we're being told that we owe trillions and trillions of dollars. It's just... I mean, I'm almost speechless at this in the numbers that you've brought up just since 2000, the change that's happened so fast. Right. Well, you know, I would say on that, um, there is one comparison that tells you everything you need to know about how phony this recovery has been and why basically the Fed is lying or uh, dreaming, one of the two. I mean, you can, if you want to take a darker view of it, you can say they're, knowledge, they're knowingly lying. If you want to be, uh, you know, somewhat, uh, 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 you know, give them a break, uh, you can say that... Um, they're uh, dreaming, but here's the here, here are the facts. If you go back to right before the crisis, the fall of 2007, because remember the crisis really s- struck in the summer of 2008. If you go back to the peak before the crisis, and you look at the NASDAQ 100, which is really the leading edge of this whole huge stock market tech 
oriented boom that we've had on Wall Street. And you take the inflation out of the index. So it's, you know, uh, apples to apples, not uh, inflated. Uh, real, the index uh, for the NASDAQ 100 uh, is, is up 200% in the last uh, 11 years, from late 2007 to uh, the fall of 2018. 200%. Now, that's Wall Street. Uh, that's a huge boom because that's even after inflation taken out. Go to Main Street. Industrial production uh, today is only 3% higher than it was 11 years ago. That's nothing, okay? Uh, the total labor hours used by the private economy today is barely 7% above where it was 11 years ago. Real median household income is 0% above where it was 11 years ago. So what I'm saying in a word is Main Street has been flatlining, barely creeping forward, if at all. And Wall Street has been booming this 200% gain in the NASDAQ index. And that is an unstable uh, uh, decoupling of finance from economy of Wall Street from Main Street, it's not sustainable. And in the long run, stock prices and bond prices and financial assets have to be anchored to uh, a real, uh, the real economy, you know, of production and income and GDP and all the rest of it, they're not. So that's why I think we're on the uh, edge of some big uh, reckoning here, if you want to use that term, where this bifurcated economy, flatlining on Main Street and booming uh, bubbles on Wall Street, uh, are going to have to uh, be resolved. You know, that brings me to the next question. Is there any correlation between the stock market and the U.S. economy truly? With the top 10% of households owning about 90% of equities trading, so for 9 out of 10 Americans, this so-called bull market has very little meaning. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, you know, that that's a very good question, and I, uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Another way to look at it is let's look at the, uh, you know, the Fed puts out these numbers called the net worth of uh, the household sector. That's all, you know, 120 million households in America or families. Now, if you look at it in the aggregate, it seems like we're doing tremendously well because if you go back to the pre-crisis peak, it was uh, about $67 trillion in net worth. Then it dropped during the crisis, and now it's come all the way back to $107 trillion. All right, so what, what the aggregate tells you is that the net worth of all American households ha has improved by $40 trillion, which is a pretty big, staggering number. Even thanks. Since, yeah, since 2007, since the pre-crisis peak. So I'm not even measuring from the bottom. I'm just saying if today's the peak of this cycle, peak to peak, $40 trillion. Now, that sounds really good, but here's the problem. If you take the net worth of the average household, it, a median household, it was $120,000 in 2007. It's $80,000 today. So the average household is lost. This is in real terms after inflation. The average household is lost one third of its net worth, even though the total uh, household sector is up by 40 trillion. So how did that happen? The answer is the top 1%, the top 10% got it all. That's, that's the problem, right? That's where it all went. So uh, now, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that it's the job of government to manage income distribution in a free market capitalist system. Some people are going to be very productive and wealthy and also lucky, or they might invent, uh, you know, the next uh, greatest things in sliced bread. And other people uh, will have an average amount, and some people will have very little, if any, net worth at all. That's just the way it works. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we go from uh, 1987, when Greenspan started this whole current era of what I call monetary central planning, excessive money printing, if we uh, look at the last 30 years, we see something that's happened to the income distribution that is not a natural 
outcome on the free market, but is a artificial consequence of what the Federal Reserve's been doing, uh, basically, to inflate Wall Street. Here, here are the key uh, statistics. If you, and this is quite amazing. If you go to 1987, the top 1% had 34% of the net wealth of our society, of the households in our society. The bottom 90% had 34%. Okay, so the, t the top 1%, the bottom 90% had the same slice, about a third each, and then everybody else had the balance. Now, here we are today, the top 1% share has gone from 34 to 40%. The bottom 90% has gone from 34 down to 20%. So today, the top 1% owns twice the amount of uh, national wealth as the bottom 90%. Now, that isn't a, a natural consequence of whatever's happened in uh, technology and uh, private capitalism in the 30 years in between. That's a consequence of a Federal Reserve that has gone from the Volcker idea that it's simply a backstop for the banking system and needs to get out of the way and not inflate the economy or try to overly manage it to what we have today with Powell and Yellen and Bernanke, uh, who believe, you know, they're in charge of running the entire uh, U.S. economy. But, it's, but they're, not, they're not improving on what capitalism would do on its own. They're only creating temporary bubbles uh, in the financial system that, as you say at the beginning of this question, uh, uh, redound uh, to the 1% and the 10% that own 45 and 85% of the financial assets. So this is a bad system. And here's the real danger. And that is it's creating a populist leftist backlash. All these new people elected to Congress are talking about socialism and single, uh, you know, uh, Medicare for all and the Green New Deal and all the rest of this stuff. It, the Fed has pretty well wrecked the U.S. economy, but if these people take power in 2020, which is po very possible in my view, they'll finish the job off, okay? So, uh, ironically, by uh, allowing the Federal Reserve to get out of control, it's created such a artificial uh, imbalance of wealth that in, t in turn, that is stimulating this uh, left-wing populist uh, uh, uprising that could really be uh, a tremendous uh, danger and harm uh, to our prosperity going forward. It's terrifying. Yeah, it kind of is. And, you know, the only thing I wonder, we, we can talk about this, and it's pretty obvious, look at this new crop of people elected to the Congress, look what they're talking about. Um, you look at the wealth figures that I've just cited, none of this is a secret like uh, it's sneaking up on us. It's plain as, uh, you know, the nose on your face, I guess. And yet all these people down in the stock market, these robo machines and day traders seem to think it's just blue skies ahead. Just keep, you know, boosting stock prices as if they're capitalizing for the indefinite future, a solid, stable, disciplined economy. And we have the opposite. It's not solid, it's not stable, and it's not disciplined. It is bubble-ridden, it is debt-ridden, and uh, we're at a uh, business cycle that's about ready to roll over uh, into the next recession. So I wouldn't be pricing, you know, earnings uh, at 25 times, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't be using a PE of 25 times earnings in the face of uh, what, uh, in the jaws of what we're facing today. But uh, that's another reason why there's going to be big trouble going forward. The market is way, way overvalued. We're going to have another big thundering uh, collapse. I don't know when, but one of these days. And uh, we'll just be back in the soup again. It's like it's akin to the fall of the Roman Empire. They don't, it's, it's almost like they don't see what they're doing because they're taking a massive amount of people, making them incredibly poor, taking away their dreams, making them angry so that they want to take away from the rich and they don't want to work for anything because they can't find a job. So here come the leftists with right. their socialism, free everything for everybody, 
and free stuff for everybody, right? Yeah, I know. Well, uh, so in some ways, you can blame. I, I blame the Republicans, and I blame the conservatives. I'm one of them. I'm kind of a, you know, a true free market, hard money, uh, you know, uh, libertarian, fiscally oriented. But I think the Republican Party has betrayed uh, their principles uh, because, you know, do you see any Republicans down there doing anything about this out of control deficit? Have any of them said, what's wrong at the Federal Reserve? Why are we filling it with these lifetime, you know, bureaucrats and Keynesian PhDs who uh, are perverting the whole nature of our capitalist system? Are any of them asking these questions? No. They're more interested in seeing what country we can invade next or what regime we can change. And now they're all over the place with Venezuela today as if it was our decision to make as to whether they had a fair election or not. I don't know if they did, but uh, let them work it out. It's not any uh, skin off our back. Venezuela is absolutely no threat to America, okay? And uh, our foreign policy ought to be homeland defense, not uh, global meddling uh, in every country around the world uh, or maintaining this uh, far-flung empire uh, that is bankrupting us uh, fiscally and is failing miserably everywhere we go. Is Syria a success? Is uh, Libya a success? Is Iraq a success? Uh, Yemen is a genocide, and yet uh, we're basically supplying the, we the weapons to the Saudis to do that. Um, you know, uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, Washington needs to change directions and get back to America first. Now, Trump was right about America first. The big mistake he made was he surrounded himself by people who believe in empire first, not America first. So he's getting terrible advice from Bolton and Pompeo and you know all the rest of the failed generals he, he has brought in there. Uh, and as a result, uh, he, he gets thwarted at every turn. He, he wanted to get the troops out of Syria. We had 2,000 soldiers there that never should have been there in the first place. He couldn't even get them out because of all this rear guard uh, you know, uh, uh, action against what he was trying to do and uh, the uh, frustrating uh, uh, efforts they made to thwart. Uh, his objectives. So uh, that's uh, kind of what uh, I've talked about in uh, Pete Trump, uh, my new book, and that is he wanted to do the right thing by reigning in the, reigning in the empire and going back to some homeland defense, America first idea, but he got thwarted at every turn by the deep state and the military industrial complex and all the generals and the neocon interventionists who make a living uh, you know, uh, finding a crisis in practically any country in the world, on the one hand, and on domestically took himself hostage by embracing this uh, crazy bubble uh, and by bloating an already bad uh, deficit and national debt that he inherited. So um, I don't think it's going to work. And that's why, you know, I, I use the title Peak Trump. It's behind us. You already peaked. And uh, I'm afraid it's downhill from here. David, what would you do if you were in his shoes right now? You know, the, the flippant answer would be to quit, you know. Besides <laughs> but, quit. <laughs> Don't but quit. I guess he, but the Donald is not about to do that. Uh, I, I would recommend that he take a few weeks off and sit down with a clean sheet of paper and try to figure out exactly what he's doing and bring in a new set. He needs to clean house at the Fed. He needs to clean house in the White House. He's got terrible economic advisors who are telling him all kinds of uh, nonsense that uh, you know won't be uh, achievable or realistic and uh, rethink what the problems are of the country and how we can truly make America great again. How do you make America great again? You shut down the Fed. How do you make America great again? You shut down the empire and you slash the defense budget from $720 billion to maybe $250 billion. How do you make America great again? You reform the entitlements so that we don't bankrupt ourselves as the baby boom uh, retires. How do you make America great again? You get Washington out of everybody's business and turn all of these grant programs and welfare and food stamps and Medicaid and all the rest of it back to the states. 
Because here's why. If, you, if, if the 50 states have to manage these programs, the ones that want to be real generous will attract a lot of uh, people on their rolls and they'll go bankrupt trying to fund them. And the states that want to have uh, a disciplined um, approach to work fair and to helping people that need it, but keeping those off that don't, uh, will have a lighter tax burden. And the next thing you know, the competitive process of what, what uh, Brandeis once called laboratories of democracy, the states, will solve the welfare problem. You can't solve the welfare problem in Washington because everybody comes to Washington and thinks, you know, some other state will pay the tab or we can borrow it and, you know, and future uh, taxpayers will pay the tab. If we devolve the whole where welfare function and uh, social services and all the rest of it to the states and force them to compete with each other to manage uh, let's say doing good with fiscal uh, costs, we might get this under control. But as long as it's in Washington, everybody is leaning on the sled in the same direction of more, more, more without asking who's paying. That is brilliant. I think uh, you just hit on the solution. If you take oh, it back to the states and let, and them, let compete. them compete. Right. Right. And then you'll have red state, blue state, but the competition will be for who wants to live there and pay taxes and who wants to get the hell out of Dodge like they're leaving New York and California in droves right now, if you look at the census numbers, because the taxes are uh, uh, too high. That, that's the uh, so small government has always been the answer. You know, Jefferson was right <laughs> 200 and some years ago, uh, and we're never going to solve the big government monster, the Leviathan. Uh, unless we get back to smaller units of government and local accountability. Wow. Wow. That is excellent. That's the first time I've ever, and all the people I've talked to, that somebody has hit the nail on the head on the solution because I really think you're right. I really do. And it's not saying, hey, there's no more federal government money for you. It's Indiana versus. Yes, you know, Minnesota. Right. You know what I mean? It, it's uh... And let the federal government do what it can do, okay? And the one thing the federal government can do, I might say on this, is support workfare. In other words, if you put uh, AFDC and food stamps and Medicaid and housing and all that back to the states, let them compete, as we've been talking about, they will find the right balance uh, between generosity on the one hand and costs on the other. Now, at the federal level, we have something called the Earned Income Tax credit it um it needs some refinement because there's uh, you know there's some leakage in it let's say but if you uh, fix those which are possible what you're saying is if you work 10 more hours this week you'll get a bigger tax credit if you improve your skills and you get a better job you get a larger tax credit because the tax credit is based on your earnings. And if you're not working, you get no tax credit. And if you're working half time, you get a little. And if you're working hard, two or three jobs, you get more until you reach a certain income level and then it phases out. So that would help the national economy, workfare at the federal level, welfare at the state level, and separation of the functions of government between what Washington can do uh, and what uh, the states uh, need to do. Very nice. It's almost the opposite right now. The more you work, the more you're taxed. That's right. <laughs> it's That's like, right. why should you do it? You're going to take away. Right. Now, David, with what's coming, you know, this is unsustainable once again with what the banks have done. Should the federal government bail out institutions like they did in 2008 or this time? You know, President Grant, they came to President Grant and said, you know, back in the day and said, hey, we've done it. You know, we, we need a bailout. And he said, no, figure yeah. it out yourself. Should we well, do the same thing? Of course, the, the biggest mistakes that we've made uh, by that, I mean, Washington in the last decades has been the bailouts over and over. And then that culminated in the 700 billion that they pumped into Wall Street and then bailing out GM and uh, uh, Chrysler and the auto industry. 
you know, that is the opposite of what what is required for capitalism to prosper. You, you have to have uh, winners and losers. You have to have financial discipline. You have to have consequences if people build up too much debt or they take too big a risk or they have just uh, a product that nobody wants anymore. And uh, so we need to get out of the bailout business, uh, the bailout state, 100%. It should never happen again. And it wouldn't have happened, frankly, if you wouldn't have had all these people from Wall Street and the Keynesians at the Fed uh, running around with their hair on fire, Bernanke and Paulson and the rest of them, uh, in the fall of 208, uh, you know, convincing George Bush, who didn't know much, um, that, uh, you know, we were going to go down a black hole. Remember, he said, if we don't do something, this sucker is going down. That's what George Bush said, because he didn't know any better. He was getting extremely bad advice. Uh, and we can't do that again. Now, uh, am I optimistic that if we have another crisis that they uh, uh, will allow nature to take its course and markets uh, to clear and discipline themselves? I'm not very optimistic. But on the other hand, they promised this was a one-time expedient. It was a hundred-year flood. It was a ultra-emergency. We'll never do it again. And I think there are going to be a lot of people including some of these progressives and lefties who were elected, who will say, hey, you, you were lying last time. Why should we believe you this time? So maybe there's a chance for an odd coalition of the libertarians on one side and the uh, anti-Wall uh, Street progressives on the other side to stop this. Uh, we'll have to see. That could work in our favor. It's sort of an odd equation, but very interesting yeah. possibility right there. Now, David, is Donald Trump the favorite for re-election? Um, I, you know, people seem to think so at the moment, but uh, here's what I say. He was elected, uh, he was sworn in January 2017. That was month 90 of a long, weak business expansion. He was elected for 48-month term, right, uh, four years. So that means that if at the end of his term will be in month 138 of a business expansion that started in June 2009. We have never been there before in all of history. There's never been a business expansion that lasted that long. A recession came along, a, a crisis came along, a black swan came along. I don't believe that Trump is going to make it to month 138 without a recession and a crisis. And I'll tell you what, if there is a recession and the stock market falls apart, which I'm pretty sure is going to happen, he won't have a snowball's chance of being reelected. Wow. And do you think that's going to happen before 2020? Yes. How interesting. You know, as a reminder for everyone, we've published an extensive free report about Mr. Stockman's amazing predictions and key insights. The link is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash David. David, this has been an amazing interview. Now, you recently published a book that you've mentioned. Please tell us all about it and how to follow your work. Okay, well, two ways. Uh, the book is called uh, uh, Peak Trump, and, you know, as he's peaked. Uh, the Undrainable Swamp and the Fantasy of MAGA, Make America Great Again. Uh, and the book basically goes through many of the things that we've talked about here today as to why we're in such deep trouble. He inherited that trouble, but unfortunately, on foreign policy, he's being stopped by the deep, deep state, and on domestic policy. He's doing the wrong thing, making everything worse. The second thing is I publish daily uh, uh, something called uh, David Stockman's Contra Corner. It's a daily commentary on Washington, Wall Street, uh, international economic developments, central banks, all of this complex of stuff uh, that's, uh, you know, impinging on the world that we uh, have to cope with. So those are the two uh, things you can, uh, you know, Google and find uh, either one of them. The book is on Amazon, uh, and you can find uh, my blog on Google. You know, David, I'm just curious. Um, since you see this fall coming before 2020, and you believe that it's going to derail um, the president's re-election bid, who would you predict will win the presidency in 2020? 
Well, the Democrats, a good question. And um, the Democrats so far seem to have about 25 candidates. Yeah, I know they do. <laughs> By the time we get to the primary season, I, I say they'll have 30 candidates plus Mickey Mouse, okay? And uh, I think any of the 30 could, if we have another recession and the big stock market crash, any of them will win, including Mickey Mouse, okay? So we have to be prepared for a Democratic uh, recovery, a Democrat recovery a landslide uh, possibly uh, in 2020 and it'll take the stock market down and people need to you know you can say well I'm so smart I'm going to watch this by the day and when I see the handwriting on the wall I'll get out of dodge it's I think that's a very dangerous thing these markets are so artificial they're so uh, manipulated that uh, when uh, the thing goes down it'll go so, down so fast you won't be able to get out of the way so I say the odds of a recession of a stock market crash, of a democratic uh, recovery or even landslide in 2020 are so high. And those three things together will take the stock market from 27, you know, 100, uh, where, uh, to almost 2,800 where it is today, the S&P 500, to half that level. Uh, you might as well get prepared now, uh, uh, keep your powder dry, liquefy uh, your assets. And when, you know, the crisis comes, there'll be an opportunity to buy a lot of good things uh, at a fraction of the price uh, that's being, you know, offered today. Wow, excellent. David, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Glad to be with you. It's been an amazing interview. Mr. David Stockman, author, economist, and former U.S. Budget Director under President Ronald Reagan. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.